like to thank everyone for joining us. My name is Rebecca Lowe. I am the Adult Program Coordinator with the Lewis Public Library. And welcome to our series, Science and Society, Making Sense of the World Around Us. This lecture series is co-organized and moderated by Fred Dilla, Executive Director Emeritus of the American Institute of Physics and author of Scientific Journeys. Linda Dilla, former former public information officer at the Jefferson Laboratory in the US Department of Energy, and Colin Norman, the former news editor at Science. So with that, I am gonna turn this over to Linda. So Linda, the floor is yours, and please remember to unmute yourself. Thank you. Make sure you unmute, there you go. I'm unmuted now. Welcome everyone. I have the privilege of introducing Lindy, not Linda, Lindy Elkins Totten, who's a planetary scientist and the principal investigator of a project called the Psyche Mission. And she also is the Arizona State Vice President, University Vice President of Inter Interplanetary Initiative. It's a long title. Her research concerns are um, about the formation and evolution of rocky planets. And we have a little bit of rock in our own planet. So it helps It helps with our own um, knowledge of the way this earth was formed. She's a National Academy member. And just like Fred, she got her undergraduate master's and PhD at MIT. So with that, and Fred has to go <laughs> thumbs up with that. So with that, I'd like to introduce Lindy to talk about the Psyche Project. Thank you so much. I am really, really happy to be here. It's great to have a chance to chat with you all today and an honor. So let me start my screen share. Here we go. All right. The first question that I wanna ask is why do we explore humanity? Why have we traditionally explored? There are so many justifications, but I think that the main reason we explore is because of the irresistible pull of a place that no one has ever seen. And I think we just can't help ourselves. And so I think about the time about 200 years ago when Antarctica was first seen. And now Antarctica, not an inviting place, not a place filled with economic possibilities, but irresistible. And the race to the pole was immediately on. And so since that time, we have uh, sent uh, crude and human expeditions to our neighbor, the moon, a rocky body. This is the Orientale impact basin. It's on the limb of the moon. You can't see it from the earth, but it's a very beautiful impact crater. So if you need a favorite lunar impact crater, I suggest Orientale. It's the most beautiful one, in my opinion. Another rocky body that we've visited that we have, in fact, a fleet of robots investigating on our behalf is Mars. This is a cliff on Mars uh, called Burns Cliff, and it's named after Roger Burns, who was a mineralogist who, before missions went to Mars, hypothesized correctly about what the chemistry of the Martian surface would be. And um, I actually took all the courses he offered when I was an undergraduate, and he was a lovely human being, which I really appreciate that combination of a great scientist and a really generous soul. And so I'm really glad that this cliff on Mars is named after him. We've also sent robots to fly by and to orbit gas giants like Jupiter and the icy outer bodies of Uranus and Neptune and also icy moons. So we've been to rocky bodies and icy bodies and gas rich bodies, but one kind of thing that we've never visited is a body that's made mostly of metal. And that's what we think asteroid 16 Psyche is. Uh, this is an artist's conception of what this asteroid might look like. And uh, because when we were first proposing the mission, as I'll talk about later, uh, not everybody had heard of Psyche. And uh, we're making inroads worldwide on who's heard of Psyche with the, by promoting this mission. But we named the mission after the object just to make it simple. I feel like NASA has got too many acronyms. So Psyche is not an acronym. It was named, the asteroid was named in 1852 by its discoverer, uh, whose name was Annabale di Gasparis in Naples, Italy. And he named it Psyche after the goddess Psyche. And so uh, thus the mission also received its name. But uh, I did not set out in my career to be the lead of a NASA mission. I'm also often, often asked by people, when was the moment in your life when you knew that you wanted to study the planets or 
sometimes people say when you wanted to be an astronomer, and, and all of us who are science groupies know that there's a difference between astronomers and planetary scientists, and I'm not an astronomer, but of course you don't want to be pedantic. Instead, I just say, I, I really didn't know that I wanted to be the lead of a NASA mission. This is me at age seven. Uh, I was obsessed with horses. And uh, this is Barney, this little white pony. He was one of the first horses that I ever rode. And I, I, I rode competitively for many years. Now, I'm going to um, flout the directions of our kind host and hostess with the following question. I found when I've given public talks over the years that about a third of the people who are interested in planetary science and astronomy, as we all here more or less are, had a formative moment when they were 10, 11, 12 years old when they saw Saturn through a telescope. And so if that is true for you, if your life was transformed in some way by seeing Saturn when you were a kid, could you just enter the age into the chat? I'm really, really curious about this. And I know it kind of messes up your chat a little bit, but forgive me for this. <laughs> the, the audience participation part. Oh, good, I'm getting the thumbs up from Linda. Uh, because when I was about 12, I saw Saturn through a telescope that my brothers had set up on the roof of our house in Ithaca, New York. But I still wanted to be a veterinarian. <laughs> so it did not actually change me into who I am now. And um, and so I'll just mention gratuitously that uh, that this story of the pathway from really caring about teams, which it turns out is what motivates me to where I am, I wrote about in this memoir that I published this year. Um, although I don't think I mentioned Barney, which was an oversight in, in retrospect. So here's a little shout out to MIT. Um, this is me in my PhD gown and I was on faculty at the time and I'm giving my son Turner a hug while he gets his bachelor's. And so to say there's plenty of tech spirit in our family, but um, it, it wasn't that, I, that I'd set out to, to lead this mission. Um, in the end, you know, the thing that really motivates me, I've found really in retrospect is finding ways that people can work together in such a way that they do better than when they're on their own. To me, this is the essence of humanity. Um, how do you take something so complex, like a space mission, so complex that no single person understands it, and yet together we can build it and it works in space without a repair person for decades? I mean, if that is not a miracle of human evolution, I don't know what it is. I just think that systems engineering and the ability to do that is astonishing. And so, how do you forge a team whose very functioning ensures an improved product? Um, this is a, just a little part of the Psyche team. At peak, we're at 800 people. Right now, we're about 350 people. We're in um, literally dozens of organizations around the world. And uh, we have a motto. And that motto is, the best news is bad news brought early. You want, it's, there's so much packed in there, which I'm sure you can unpack in your own minds as I'm saying it. But the point is, if you have a team where it's the person who authentically knows what's happening, like the boots on the ground person with the soldering iron in their hand or the one who's running the numbers, if they are able to speak up through multiple layers of senior management and say what's really going on, there's something wrong. I don't think this is working. There's an error, you know, whatever it is, then you can fix it. But if they wait too long, it's too late. And so we've really tried to live by that motto. So to draw down project risk, you have to have a team culture that allows every person to speak, which means that you can't have a team culture of harassment or bullying or belittling each other or screaming and shouting on the table, pounding on the table. So this is something I find endlessly fascinating. And frankly, it is way, way harder than the science or the engineering. <laughs> and it's often kind of overlooked and underappreciated in science and engineering cultures. So why am I talking about this? Well, just to make it very clear, this is foreshadowing. <laughs> this is the literary device of foreshadowing. Um, so why does positive team culture matter so much? First of all, you make better decisions. More ideas are heard, cool th heads think better. Project risk is literally reduced. The best news is bad news brought early. And attraction and retention of talent, um, rudeness and bullying and harassment actually reduce diversity because we feel that you haven't got a group that's there to support you that's like you and you're in a bullying environment, you're likely to cut your losses and go someplace where you might really be able to succeed. And um, back in the day uh, at, at MIT, a place that I do love, and um, I'm still on visiting committees and, and very connected, and it's a great place, but 
not totally known for its supportive team culture. And, uh, and sometimes I would have this conversation in, in group meeting about um, cultural norms and, you know, ways that we could work together better. And, and, and I was pretty much told that, you know, the emotional state that we were in was irrelevant and also detrimental to actually doing science. But now I can say that a good team culture is literally worth a billion dollars because it's one of the reasons that NASA picked our team because they could see that we listened to each other authentically and supported each other in the several years of reviews that we went through. And that's our budget, it's about a billion dollars. And so uh, this is ways of saying how important I think that this is. All right, it's important to remember that despite the lovely artist rendition that I showed you, we do not know what Psyche looks like. This is a photo of Psyche from my backyard. That's it. Did you spot it? That's Psyche. Asteroid, of course, means star-like. Um, and yeah, it was a backyard telescope, but it's not much bigger and brighter in the Mount Wilson 60-inch, and it's only four pixels in Hubble. And so uh, it is a small object that is far away. Um, this is the best that we have of this asteroid. This is, these are not photos, these are shape models. And they all come from this paper, Shepard et al, 2021. And this is a figure from Shepard et al with the latest shape model that they made at the bottom, a previous shape model that the same team made at the top, and then someone else's shape model in the middle. These are made by looking at how radiation reflects off the surface of Psyche as it rotates on its axis. So the Earth takes 24 hours to rotate and Psyche takes about four hours, so it goes around pretty quickly. Uh, and this combines data from uh, radar from Arecibo, rest in peace. Arecibo has been very important in the past to understand Psyche. Also from um, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array and um, adaptive optics on the Keck Telescope in Hawaii and also the VLT in Chile and also using um, amateur astronomers occultations watching Psyche move in front of stars. And so it, it's tempting to say that, um, that we know what the shape of Psyche is more or less because these models agree, but other quite talented teams have also made shape models that are not so much as in, in agreement as Ferre is with the Shepard models. But this is the one that we're using for now. And uh, to kind of to kind of um, uh, you know game this a little bit, I, I say that psyche is shaped like a potato because of course potatoes come in many shapes, <laughs> and so and so it kind of uh, points out that we don't really really know what it is. However, very critically, it's not a sphere, and that becomes extremely important when we try to calculate stable orbits around it because its gravity field is going to be strangely shaped. Uh, so here are, to give you some perspective, um, here are shape models for Vesta, um, which of course Dawn mission recently visited, and Psyche. Psyche is about the size to be Vesta's core, although we don't think that Psyche is pure metal. I'll get into that in a minute. And uh, here's Eros, uh, which I just put in for fun because Psyche and Eros were, of course, the couple in myth. Uh, and then there's another asteroid on this screen already. I don't know if you can see it. Um, it's right there. That's Bennu. So uh, Bennu that OSIRIS-REx is fabulously bringing back a sample return from. Bennu is very, very, very much smaller than Psyche, which in turn is smaller than Vesta. And so this is a good way for us to remember that asteroids come in many shapes and sizes and also many compositions. And so just because we're visiting more of them doesn't mean we're learning the same thing. In fact, we're learning quite different things. They tell us really different things about the formation of planets. So this is how big Psyche is compared to Arizona, where I live now, um, and also Massachusetts, where I spent much of my life. I'd like to say Psyche is about the size of Massachusetts without the Cape. Uh, and the, the surface area of Psyche is about the same as the state of California. And so as I'll explain, we're going to orbit Psyche for 26 months. And uh, you could try to imagine flying above California for 26 months and trying to learn everything about it. It's, there's a lot to learn. And so I, I'm really excited about, about when that happens. It's going to be incredible. All right, so where is it? So here's our, 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 um, our solar system from the sun. Uh, out until Jupiter, and you can see the asteroid belt in purple, and you can see the Trojan asteroids that orbit with Jupiter in Jupiter's orbit, 60 degrees ahead of and 60 degrees behind Jupiter in two of Jupiter's Lagrange points. Those are just particularly interesting asteroids that orbit uh, co-orbital with Jupiter. 
And here's where Psyche is. Psyche is in the outer main belt. So sometimes Psyche is on the same side of the sun as the earth, and sometimes it's on the far side. And when it's on the same side um, of the sun as earth and the orbits are aligned just right, it can be as close as about 250 million kilometers. And when it's on the far side of the sun, it can be as far as 650 million kilometers. And what does that really mean? Well, the point, um, the comparison is Mars. The closest that Mars comes is 55 million kilometers. Closest Psyche comes is 250 million kilometers. So Psyche is practically in our backyard. Uh, Mars is practically in our backyard compared to Psyche, which is really quite far away. Um, why am I stressing this? What is the point? We do understand the asteroid belt is out past Mars and where the outer main asteroid belt is. It's because <laughs> Psyche is never going to make us rich. <laughs> I don't know if um, if you all have seen some of these many, many, many headlines um, that have been running now for uh, six years in press from all over the world. Um, and, and these are two of the more uh, trustworthy sources, Forbes and Smithsonian. Um, look at Smithsonian. This metal-rich potato-shaped asteroid could be worth $10 quintillion dollars. Well, it turns out that if we could have brought Psyche to Earth and then sold it on the 2017 metals market, we would have raised $10 quintillion, except that everything I just said is a total fantasy. There is it, These are great headlines, but there is zero truth involved. <laughs> and so I just think it's important to point out we have absolutely no technology to bring Psyche to the Earth in, in any way. And even if we did, it would collapse the metals market and make the metals worth nothing because it would flood the market. And so everything about it is a fantasy. And so I, I really like pointing out that the Miami Herald, Katie Camaro at the Miami Herald really worked to get this right. Asteroid psyche won't make you rich and it's not gonna hit the earth. That's another thing we hear a lot. But NASA has another reason to visit it, which is fundamental science. Uh, so I really love that. And I really honor her for doing her homework. And, and I've talked to um, Jamie Carter at Forbes who writes their space column. And he knows perfectly well that there's no truth in this idea that Psyche is gonna make us rich. But I think he's never had more readership of his column in Forbes because they're all about money. <laughs> so, and so he does tell the truth absolutely and get it right in his column, but, the, but sometimes the, the, the headlines are a little funny. So this has been an amusing aspect of, uh, of running a big NASA mission. So if Psyche is not going to hit the earth and it's not going to make us rich, well, what do we actually think is going on? Well, this is a cartoon of a planetesimal. And if you think about the very beginning of our solar system, it was a spinning disk of gas and dust around our young sun before the sun's nuclear processes even turned on. Uh, it turns out that very, very fast after the very first um, pebble-sized solids formed in our solar system, they clumped up into objects called planetesimals, little planets. And these were bodies the size of cities or continents or maybe a little bit bigger than that. And there were thousands of them. And they became the feedstock for both the rocky planets and the inner solid cores of the gas giants and the outer planets. Um, how could we possibly know this? <laughs> we know this from meteorites that fall to Earth, whose composition we measure and whose age we can determine with radioactive isotopes. So the very first solids in our solar system, those first little pebbles, are objects called calcium aluminum inclusions. And uh, they date to 4.568 billion years ago. And I used to tell my undergraduates, I haven't told them this in a while, I should start again. I used to tell them that if that one number, they hadn't memorized it and couldn't recite it by the end of the class, they failed. And so I always try to make people memorize it. And so I need you all to memorize this 4.568 billion years ago. So these planetesimals formed within 3 million years. So out of the 4,568 millions of years since then, just the first three millions of years, these all formed. So if the solar system was a 24 hour day, the planetesimals formed in the first 10 or 15 seconds. And a really interesting thing about planetesimals is that for a long time, people had no idea how they formed. We knew they had to form because we have the evidence from the um, meteorite collection and we stand on rocky planets now. So we know that 
the dust clumped up into larger objects. But here's the physics conundrum. Very small objects can be stuck together using electromagnetic forces like dust bunnies. And very big objects can stick together through gravity. But medium-sized objects have no forces that stick them together in a young solar system. So it was called the meter scale barrier. People could not figure out for a very long time how you got from pebbles to cities, basically, in that size range. And now there are a series of quite fascinating accretion processes that people have creatively invented and then discovered that they have some credibility through modeling um, that can explain the formation of planetesimals. But that's a very recent thing. We just knew they had to form. We had no idea how. And so what I'm showing you here is a planetesimal with a rocky exterior, which is the brown part, and a molten iron core. And as you all know, this is the uh, structure of our Earth, metal core, rocky exterior. It's also the structure of Mercury and Venus and Mars and the moon. The moon also has a tiny metal core. But the material that clumped up to make these planetesimals um, was had intimately mixed metal and rock on a millimeter or centimeter scale. We know this again from meteorites. And the way that uh, apparently from every indication, the metal sank to the middle is because it all melted. And then the metal being twice as dense as the rock sank to the middle and formed this core. Why would they have melted just forming in those first 3 million years? Because there was a short lived radioisotope, aluminum 26, which uh, was common enough to absolutely create the heat that would have melted these bodies and allowed the metal to drain to its middle. And there's a whole anecdote about Yuri discovering aluminum 26 and because it's, it's dead now, it's short lived, there is none of it now, it's extinct. Um, but its daughter product could be found. And I've done a bunch of these calculations myself of how hot it could get and what would happen to the metal. So that's what we think happened. We think that there were these very interesting kind of eddies and crushing sorts of uh, waves in the early disk that crushed together these planetesimals or a process called pebble accretion, lumped them all together. And then they heated up from aluminum 26 and melted and formed metal cores. So how do you get from this, a planetesimal, to a body like Psyche, which we think might even have metal on the surface? And uh, so this is the idea. Maybe it was hit uh, such that a lot of the rock was knocked off, and then it froze from the outside in, made a magnetic field in purple, and then also was tipped over on its side until it became the Psyche that we have today. Um, so is it a bit curious to you that I've spent now several minutes just describing planetesimals and their formation and the ideas of how they form and then how we could possibly go from a planetesimal to something like Psyche with all these different steps? <sighs> the problem with Psyche is that there's only one of it in our solar system. We think that there are maybe nine meteorite, uh, nine asteroids that we're pretty sure have some metal on their surface or are largely metallic. There are approximately a million and a half other asteroids that do not seem to be made of metal, and only about nine of them that seem to be made of metal. And so it's a very rare thing, and Psyche is by far the biggest of them. And as of this moment, Psyche is the densest known asteroid, as I'll show you in the next slide. So the problem is we're trying to be creative enough to think of the process that would create a very strange and singular object like this. It can't be a common process, because if it was, there'd be more than one of these objects. And so this is actually what we call our fiducial hypothesis. This is the simplest way we've been able to think of to make Psyche. And it's actually more complicated than what I just showed you, because Eric Asfog at University of Arizona has done the majority of these models, says it would actually take between eight and 11 of these impacts to knock most of the rock off the surface of Psyche. Um, so you had to have eight to 11 impacts that were destructive and not accretionary uh, in order to make a largely metallic object. And we would love for it to have frozen from the outside inward the way this shows, because we would really like Psyche to retain a magnetic field signature. It's too cold, it's too small now. It would be very, very cold. There would be absolutely no magnetic dynamo from the flowing liquid metal in the interior. 
But to record the field that it might once have had, as I showed you in this cartoon, the outside of it has to cool through what's called its Curie temperature and freeze in that magnetic field before the dynamo stops working. So this is our favorite scenario where Psyche did make a magnetic dynamo and where it did cool from the outside so it could freeze that dynamo into its outer rocks. And uh, now indeed Psyche's spin axis is knocked over into the plane of its orbit lying in the ecliptic. And I'd like to say, um, you know, in a sort of respectful way that it's like a rotisserie chicken as it, or as it spins and not like a top. So such a curious object. Now I've been telling you over and over again that Psyche is made of metal. And there are quite a number of uh, lines of evidence, but the one that we start with um, is density. And um, someone told me once you should never show data in a public talk, but I think that's really condescending. And I should think that all of you would like to see the actual data. So this is a graph that I really love. On the vertical axis, let me just orient you to what you're seeing. On the vertical axis is the bulk density of Psyche uh, from 1,000 to 13,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And before we go off of the vertical axis, look for a moment at those red dashed lines. Those are the densities of specific minerals that we suspect might be part of Psyche, the asteroid. The top one, camasite, at about well, it, I guess it's about 7,800 kilograms per cubic meter. That's a common metal mineral. It's made of iron and nickel, and it's a metal, and, it, and it's found in iron meteorites that fall to Earth. And then the next one down, troilite, just under 5,000, is iron sulfide. Did you see, or did it go by too fast, did you see in that cartoon that I showed you a moment when they were yellow volcanoes onto the surface of Psyche, the asteroid? Those we think, we actually have a very good scientific reason for thinking those might've happened. And they would be um, iron and sulfur in more or less even proportions. And that is the mineral troilite. So that's where troilite falls. And then below that is enstatite, which is a common silicate mineral. And so uh, it gives you an idea if it's just made of rocks, silicate rocks, it should be around 3000 kilograms per cubic meter. But if it's made of metal, it should be up near camasite above 7000. So that's the vertical axis. Now let's look at the horizontal axis. The horizontal axis is the year of publication of the paper that estimated Psyche's density. And so you see all these green dots are different scientific research groups estimates of the density of Psyche. Look at that one back before 2000 that's up at 11,000 kilograms per cubic meter. There is literally no material that that could be. <laughs> it's just, it's not that we don't know of things that are 11,000 kilograms per cubic meter. It's just that they don't come in asteroidal sized pieces in a growing solar system. And so I'm, I actually have to go find that paper and read what they thought it could be because that would be pretty amazing. And you can see that. Um, that the envelope of the possible densities began to narrow um, right around 2014 and 2013. And that's when we were writing our first proposal. Uh, and so at that time, the, the average density that people thought Psyche was, was even higher than it is today. And then as always happens after a NASA mission is selected, um, is lots more people start studying it. And so that's what happened. And you can see how the density then like really has narrowed down uh, up to the present day. The yellow dot there is our team's best estimate of Psyche's density based on everyone else's data and their, and their techniques and their, their methods, I mean, and their errors. And so we think Psyche is around 4,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And at the time that I made this graph for a paper that we published last year, even Cleopatra, which is thought to be almost pure metal, its density is thought to be less than the density of Psyche. How could that be? It's because there's probably pore space because most every asteroid that we know of is a rubble pile, actually. It's got pieces. And so its bulk density, if you take kind of the shape of the whole body, is the average of the material it's made of and vacuum <laughs> for the pore space. And then you can also see on the bottom right um, corner, there's a gray box. And that's where most asteroids plot. Most asteroids have densities quite a bit less than 3,000 kilograms per cubic meter. 
either because they have a lot of ice in them, which is around 1000 kilograms per cubic meter, or because there's a lot of pore space. And so this graph right here tells you so much about Psyche. Densest known asteroid, but between the density of metal and rock. It's not right at the density of metal, which would be way up there by that top red line. So it's either, for example, it could be half metal and half pore space, or it could be half metal and half rock, or it could be a mixture of rock, metal, and pore space. <laughs> so, and so we have this very interesting and fabulous situation where we're trying to design a mission to go to a truly unknown object. Because not only have humans never photographed Psyche close enough to see what it is, we've never flown by, we've never seen any other metal asteroid up close, and we're not really sure what Psyche's composition is. There are many mysteries about its composition. So this is the starting point though, and it kind of shows you the challenge that we have. So one of the things, one of the other things we can do here from Earth to try to understand what Psyche might be made of is to compare it to meteorites. So 70,000 meteorites have been found here on the surface of the earth. And uh, the reason that meteorites are pertinent, and you probably know this also, is that virtually every meteorite was recently chipped off of an asteroid in the main asteroid belt. Some meteorites come from Mars or they come from the moon. Um, and who knows, maybe we have a meteorite from Venus and we just haven't identified it yet. Um, but mostly they form a library of compositions of the asteroid belt. And so we can look at the way light reflects off of the surface of meteorites in the laboratory and compare them to how light reflects off Psyche and see which meteorites fit the best. And so I, I'm guessing that some among you are meteorite aficionados because there's always a few people, they're so fascinating. And so it is amazing to be able to tell you that these are the meteorites whose spectra best fits the asteroid by far. Um, if you look at the CB chondrite on the top left, you can see the gray parts are iron nickel metal and the brown parts are silicate rock. Look at those gray parts that were metal. You can see a number of them that are really quite round and other ones that were apparently squished a bit. They were quite obviously droplets of metal in space. People think that the CB chondrites are more or less a froth that, that was blown off of some big body early in the solar system because of an impact. You can imagine an impactor coming in and smashing into some other body and causing this huge discharge of material to be, to be um, smashed off. And, and maybe the, the, the metal would have been melted and formed droplets and then recondensed into this material. The question is, can you make an impact froth the size of Massachusetts? So, um, so the CB chondrites, uh, they're our best candidate right now because their spectra, their reflectance light spectra best fits the asteroid. But the way they were formed is so strange that it's hard to imagine that Psyche is formed that way. And so where I've been left as the lead of this mission is that I really don't even have a best guess of what Psyche is right now. And I think that makes it even more exciting. It's something very strange. And what could be better than to go to a thing that we're really not sure what it is? So let me tell you a little bit about how these missions come to be. This is a paper um, that I and my friends Ben Weiss and Maria Zuber published back in 2011. And uh, unless you are uh, an expert right in this area, probably the phrase chondrites as samples of differentiated planetesimals does not immediately enrage you. But if you are in this field, it would totally enrage you. <laughs> Um, the idea is a differentiated planetesimal is one that has melted and formed its metal core and its rocky exterior. And chondrites are a class of meteorites that are thought to have never melted. They're supposed to be the primordial material from the beginning of the solar system that was never processed. So we're proposing that this primordial material came from planetesimals that were processed. And it was one of these hilarious moments in science where we went to um, give our talks of this these papers at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. And Ben went first. He uh, had done the measurements of the meteorites. And I went second with this paper. It was a modeling paper explaining how it could be. And I went to uh, walk up to, 
take the podium to give my talk and um, the whole room was completely filled. It was filled for Ben's talk and mine. It was standing room only. People were lined along the walls in the back. And as I walked up, people came up the aisles and lined up at the question asking microphones before I had even started talking. They were lined up to rebut me. <laughs> and so that's one of those things that's very fun in the world of science just to you know I mean there's like whatever 15 people in the world who deeply care about this but they really cared so we had a great conversation and um and there was a lot more agreement you know people came to understand what every side meant and we had a great scientific conversation and then I got an email from a couple of people at Jet Propulsion Laboratory saying Lindy how would you like to propose a mission to test your hypothesis we really like this paper and so that's how the mission started. It started with a little scientific, tiny scientific controversy in a teacup, and it ended up with an invitation to start working on this mission. So that was back in 2011. Uh, our primary goal with this mission is to determine whether in fact Psyche is a part of a metal core of a planetesimal, or if it's maybe unmelted material, like maybe those CB chondrites or something else like that, or some other kind of material that we haven't figured out yet. This is another beautiful illustration by Peter Rubin, who's done all of the artwork that I've shown you, including that video. He is actually a professional Hollywood um, graphic artist. He's even made one of the few copyrighted S for Superman logos, as he told me proudly. And we oh. Zoomed on the weekend for almost two years while I downloaded into yeah. his brain all of our ideas about the science proudly. of science. And he made things like this. This is the cover of our step one proposal. So in 2014, or actually right at the very beginning of 2015, after having worked on this for four years uh, with a team of about 50 people, we submitted our proposal to NASA uh, for a step one competition. So this is a proposal that was 218 pages long. And we competed with 27 other mission proposals. And now you know, you can see immediately, this is the moment of impact between two planetesimals. We're trying to tell the story. The art was so central to telling the story. We found out at a certain point, some engineers came up to me and they said, Lindy, we don't understand why you chose a magnetometer as one of the instruments to fly on your mission, or we don't understand why you chose a gamma ray spectrometer, whatever the question was. And I realized that we on the science team had this video rolling in our heads of the formation of planetesimals and then knocking the rock off the outside and the magnetic field forming and the metal core freezing, the thing I showed you, and that the engineers and everyone else had no idea what we were talking about. Why would we design our mission this way? Because they didn't have that video of formation in their heads. So this is where Peter came in. And he made us that video. We couldn't give the video to the reviewers, but we actually made flip books out of it. And we handed it out when they came in person so they could see the video that was in our heads. So we try to tell the story over and over again. And this is one of the moments. So to my intense surprise, uh, I got a call from NASA saying that we were down selected for step two. This usually does not happen the first time through this process. So here's the cover of our step two proposal another of Peter's masterworks. And you can see this is the same impact about 30 seconds later. You can see the um, liquid red hot metal core being revealed from under the streamers of dark rocky material as that impactor screams off to the bottom left. So this baby, the concept study report is 1,053 pages long and it was written by 150 people. Uh, really one of the most intense years of my life. It's quite a process going through a NASA competition. And then in 2017, I got the call from Associate Director Thomas Zerbuchen mm -hmm. saying we've been selected for flight. So that was quite a moment. We've been working on it for six years. That's about as fast as this can ever happen. And uh, that was the call that changed my life for sure. Before I go on and describe the mission architecture, I just want to show you a really interesting thing. We've got one of the biggest student collaboration um, aspects of this mission that NASA has done. We've got four major uh, programs. One is undergraduate senior capstone programs with problems from the mission, real problems. The other one is free online courses, free to everyone in the world, including everyone on this call. Um, they're accessible through our um, webpage, psyche.asu.edu. One of them is about how NASA missions are made. 
And the third one is an art program. Um, we compete, uh, have students compete every year and we choose 16 students and we fund them to make four original works of art. And so here are just a few examples. We've had, as it says, more than 325 works so far. The one on the left, I particularly love to describe to audiences like yourself, where a lot of you will understand this. It's a beautiful giant platter made by a ceramicist. And we've had every medium that you can even imagine, like chalk artists, people who design for marching bands, people who, who cook, like everybody. And this person was a ceramicist and he wanted to make a glaze. And so this, this ceramicist made a glaze that included thermite, which is an iron bearing explosive. And that's how he made that texture. <laughs> So we've had over 1,500 undergraduates participate with the mission in just since 2017 at 58 colleges and universities. I'm really proud of this program. So the mission is led by me at Arizona State, and our, um, our mission manager is Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, our, our industry partner is Maxar. They built the chassis and the power system. Then we get science instruments from Applied Physics Laboratory, from Mail and Space Science Systems, and from Danish Technical University. And so uh, this is the size of the chassis of our spacecraft. And you can see our science instruments up at the top left, the gamma ray spectrometer, which is going to measure the composition of the surface of the asteroid from orbit. And I'm very happy to go into the fabulous geeky science of that during questions if people are interested. The neutron spectrometer is also on that boom, keeping it away from the body of the spacecraft as a help with composition. Then on the right, the magnetometers, and you can see there's one above the other on the boom that's called a gradiometer configuration so that we can effectively subtract the magnetic field of the spacecraft. And then the cameras, because of course you can't fly without cameras. You got to see what you're looking at. And we've already written the software pipeline such that the images from this mission will be on the internet within a half hour of our receiving them from the deep space network. We're not gonna edit them or you know conserve them or, or anything. We're just gonna share them with the world because that's what we really believe space exploration is for. It's so that everyone in the world can be, as Jim Bell says, like scratching their head at the same time, wondering what is that thing? Because we go out there to explore and inspire everyone. When we, uh, when we, when the beautiful robotic spacecraft unfolds its solar panels after launch, they will be almost 25 meters across. That's the size of a single tennis court and 20 kilowatts of solar power um, here on earth. Uh, near Earth, near at Earth's radius from the sun, 20 kilowatts. We're going to launch on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy, and we are going to reland the side boosters, which I got to witness um, in person at Kennedy last fall, and it is mind blowing. That's the loudest sonic boom I ever hoped here in my life. Another good story. Uh, but wait, we were scheduled to launch last August. And we did not. We didn't quite make it through COVID. We started in earnest building the spacecraft right after our critical design review, which is when you're supposed to do it. And that was in May of 2020, right after COVID hit. JPL was fully closed for several months. We did not have several months of zero work in our schedule. There were a whole variety of issues. Um, we almost made it. We made it through so many hardware challenges that we solved and things that we found through bringing bad news early. We had completed the whole spacecraft and delivered it to Kennedy, but we were not quite able to complete the testing of our guidance, navigation, and control software. Now, a launch slip of this magnitude is deeply disappointing and painful for the team in ways that I can't even describe. And it's also unfortunately extremely expensive for taxpayers. But here is the lesson. A very large contributor to our slip was a failure of culture in one part of our team. There was a part of the team that was effectively silenced by two layers of management that were not authentically sending up the information about how desperate they were for extra help and how they didn't think they were gonna make it. So they didn't receive the support that they needed. And so in a very tragic way, this launch slip is the validation that team culture is critical, not just for ethical reasons and not just for daily functioning, but literally for overall success and even for budget. And so um, we are doing way, way better now. And it's been a very exciting year in both the best and the worst ways. So um, we are now, let's see, sorry, I'm just 
struggling with there's supposed to be words there that vanished. The launch period, colon, is now October 5th through 25th. So ideally, we will launch on October 5th at Kennedy Space Center from pad 39A at 10 o'clock in the morning local time. And I recently met the CEO of NASDAQ, who, and she happens to be a huge space fan. And she tells me she's going to work with NASA to put a live stream of the launch up the front of their building in New York City. And so that would be kind of great. I guess they did that for Mars. So, and we're going to arrive in 2029. So it's um, it's 5.8 years. You can see here the trajectory. We're going to launch in October from Earth. We're going to go spinning. We're going to go out from the sun and then back in again. Actually, it's an interesting thermal problem. Get a gravity assist from Mars and then go out again and get capture at Psyche in 2029. So that is our trajectory in our plan. Uh, and so when we get to Psyche, we're going to start um, at a high altitude uh, orbit, orbit A, and then we'll step down orbit B, orbit C, and we'll do what's called a plane change maneuver to orbit D. And the reason we have to do this is the aforementioned issue with the gravity. We've got to understand the gravity field. Imagine if half of Psyche, like the right half in this picture, was metal, and the left half was rock at half the density and is shaped like an uneven potato. It's going to have a pretty crazy gravity field. So, um, so we'll go from A, where Psyche will be effectively a point mass, um, and then we'll keep uh, stepping down as we know the gravity field better and better until we're very, very close. So I want to show you some pictures of the spacecraft hardware, and then we're done. So this is a shipping container for a spacecraft. And the spacecraft is built in a clean room, uh, and this is basically a miniature clean room. <laughs> These shipping containers are amazing. They're fully instrumented, so you know the temperature and the shock and everything else at every moment. And they're fully sealed, and they have duplicate generators to keep it all running in case one fails. And so this is how the spacecraft was moved from Maxar up in the San Francisco Bay Area down to Jet Propulsion Laboratory for integration. There is a stencil on the side of this which says, spaceflight hardware do not drop. And um, it's worried me so much. And then I'll show you in a moment the moment that that's important because I just couldn't picture there was a moment like that. So Henry Stone's our project manager. This is himself and myself um, in uh, the JPL Clean High Bay. So proud of our beautiful spacecraft. You can see in silver behind us is the high gain antenna through which we will send all our data back. This is the team that installed the deep space optical comm, the thing that's in that silver captain um, just above their heads. This is a technology demonstration we're flying for NASA. It has nothing to do with our science mission whatsoever, but during the first part of our mission, it's going to be tested repeatedly doing communications with the Earth using lasers instead of radio waves. You can encode a lot more information in a laser. And so this is uh, one of the first really major demonstrations of this technology. And we joke that it's going to be how we're going to stream Netflix to Mars and get that really big data going. So watch out for DSOC. That's going to be exciting. It's kind of a hero photo from a couple of years ago. Um, this is a close up on the left of the Hall effect ion thrusters with their red removed before flight caps and the white arm there that has effectively like a shoulder and an elbow so you can move the thrusters away from the spacecraft. This is how our spacecraft propulsion works. Um, here you can see the guys um, just preparing to install them. There's one on each side of the spacecraft. And on the right, is what they look like uh, when they're not turned on. And on the left is what they look like when they are turned on. And that's in a thermal chamber, a vacuum chamber at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The propulsive agent is the noble gas xenon. So we're gonna fly 1,060 odd kilograms of xenon in a tank. And what happens is that xenon gets ionized and then it's got a charge and it gets sent through um, a potential field out through this little dinner plate sized thruster. And it's just the momentum transfer of individual ions of xenon that moves the spacecraft forward. It's um, got an efficiency of energy transfer way above 90%. It's by far the most efficient way to move through space, but it's slow. However, it's the way that you can get out as far as Psyche on a Discovery class uh, budget. We have to test um, the spacecraft for electromagnetic compatibility 
Um, and the way you have to do that is by putting it in a giant Faraday cage so that all of the external fields are excluded and you're only dealing with the spacecraft fields. And so this is a spacecraft size Faraday cage made out of conductive carbon fiber built inside the giant clean room at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. To me, you know, a techie science person, this is just fabulous geekiness to look at. And so I want to show it. Then we had to go through uh, thermal vacuum chamber testing. So you have to test as you fly, T-A-Y-F. And that means putting the whole spacecraft, this is the bottom of the spacecraft with its gold adapter ring. That's how it'll be connected to the rocket. You can see two people for scale on the left-hand side. And that giant thermal vacuum chamber at JPL with a, with a, um, a, radi a diameter of 25 feet becomes completely evacuated um, to space vacuum and then chilled to the temperature of liquid nitrogen with many, many tanker trucks of liquid nitrogen that just lined up at the JPL gate and came going up the hill to the thermovac chamber all during the days of our test, which we did really well on. Testing the solar arrays, getting extended with gravity offloaded using that big scaffolding at the top. And then finally, here's the moment where maybe you could drop it, I suppose. <laughs> This is, the, this is the shipping container arriving at Kennedy on a C-17. Uh, we had many shipping container excitements, which I can also tell stories about. Um, we had to take the shipping container to March Air Force Base and make sure it really fit in a C-17, just inches to spare. Because uh, unfortunately, there's no larger transport plane that's available. So if it had not fit in a C-17, we would have had to drive it from California to Florida. And I have it on good authority that when Galileo, I believe it was Galileo, so don't quote me because maybe it was a different mission, but I'm sure sure it was Galileo, got shipped across Route 10, just like we would have had to do, trucked across Route 10. And when it arrived in Florida, there were bullet holes in it. People had shot at it. So I did not want to drive my beautiful spacecraft. So it fit, which is great. And so the final slide is me on the left and Brian Bowen, our assembly test and launch operations manager on the right, looking up at the comms panel inside our beautiful spacecraft. And so we invite you to come to our website and follow us on social media, and especially to cheer on October 5th when God willing, and if you keep all your fingers crossed, we are going to launch on that beautiful Falcon Heavy. Thank you so much for letting me share this story. That was incredible. I do, thank you. I do have a couple of questions. Um, how long does it take to communicate from the control room to the spacecraft? Mm. So it really, really depends on uh, where the psy psyche and the earth are, because it could be between 250 and 650 million kilometers. And, um, and so it's something like between, uh, say, say, like 16 to 18 minutes up to 30 minutes, um, I think is, is what most of the mission is going to be. And then, of course, there's times when the sun is in the way. And so then we have no communications. Yep. Is there one control room that's going to manage it all, or are you bouncing it around the Earth? The well, the deep space room. network, so which of the dishes is talking to the spacecraft does bounce around the Earth, but there is only one mission control, and that and all the signals come and go from there, and that's at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, although the data center is at Arizona State, and of course, we'll have people analyzing the data all over the world. Here's a question from Sam in our audience. What would be the most exciting or possibly puzzling outcome and or measurement and finding of your mission? Well, my dearest hope is that, well, let me preface this by saying, probably everything I told you that we know about the science of psyche that I told you today is wrong, probably wrong. We're doing our best to imagine what it might be. Um, but space always surprises us completely. And my favorite thing would be if it really is not the core of a planetesimal, but instead some bizarre super reduced material where all the iron is reduced to metal, um, but it never was melted and made part of a core. It would be a kind of material that people hadn't found in the asteroid, in the meteorite collection. That would be kind of my favorite thing, something really different and unexpected. Are there, this is from Kevin Blackney in our audience, are there other countries in this collaboration? Is it a is it around the world or just in this country? 
No, we have international collaborators, but um, we don't, uh, it was a little bit limited by the terms of the budget in this program, but the magnetometers are made by Danish Technical University and they are spectacular, amazing magnetometers. And that team was just our actually highest functioning instrument team. They're just spectacular. I can't say enough good about them. We have scientists in France, um, and uh, and we do and other countries as well, but you know it's mostly U.S. Uh, what we have that we have those parts. One more question before we end. We're in the middle of an asteroid belt with Psyche. Any chance we're going to hit anything? Any of the other yeah. asteroids that are out there? Tim Shaw asked that question from the audience. So it's such a great question, and especially knowing that there are between a million and two million asteroids in the asteroid belt, I can't help imagining that it's like Star Wars or you have to like dodge in and out of the asteroid field. But the truth is, space is gigantic, and we can't even find an asteroid to fly by and take pictures of on the way. So there's virtually no chance we're going to run into anything. And sadly, we're probably not even going to get to study anything else. It's just psyche. Fantastic. You have inspired a lot more people that will be cheering Psyche on as it launches in that inside that launch window. And where I'm personally, I'm always fascinated since I grew up with rockets falling into the ocean to see the rocket launch land again. That's that's just it's incredible a surprise, isn't it? It I is. All right. So I have to tell you a 30 second story because I see sure. we're not the hour. So um, last fall, after all of the drama and fear and, and gnashing of teeth and tears, we were uh, we went to a continuation slash termination review at NASA headquarters at the end of our giant review board. Great review board report, by the way, available on NASA about everything that happened. And they continued us. And five days later, I and a few people from the team flew to Kennedy to sit on console in mission control for a, a Falcon Heavy launch in practice for our own launch. And so we all sat there playing with the graphical user interface and watching the rocket take off. And the minute the rocket had taken off, we were watching the big screens at the front of the room. Everyone in the building ran outside to see it with our eyes right over our heads. And then uh, they were landing the boosters. So we saw the boosters separate and we saw the first engine burn of the boosters, and then the boosters fell into a giant fog bank early in the morning in Florida. And we're watching, we're watching, because we know they're landing just three quarters of a mile away. And there's a little gap between the ground and the fog bank. And then suddenly we see the boosters appear in that gap. And in that moment, they turned on their engines to slow down and land properly. And that's when the giant sonic boom happened. And actually a bunch of us just like shrieked reflexively because it was so loud. And it set off one car alarm, and it was the Tesla. And that's my story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask everyone to unmute yourselves. And our tradition is to all clap and, and say thank you for a fabulous thank talk. Thank you. And thank you. And I'm going to clap for you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank, you. Will. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. To go read Lindy's book, this is in uh, the library as well as in Browse About. You may borrow it or buy it. And we love for you to use our local independent bookstore, Browse About, hey, to that. You you'll, that. You'll hear a lot about, you'll read a lot about her personal story. And as a woman of the same age as Lindy, if you're in the science field, we did, we, we had to go through some things. So that's a good way to put it. I was computer science and Lindy was in um, the, uh, an, another science field that had the same problem. So thank you all. Yeah. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, everyone. We only went over one minute. So appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you so thank much. You. Appreciate it, everyone. Take care. Bye.